Hi, my name is Ashwani Jha and this talk is about convolutional modeling in SPM, particularly for MEG and EEG. So in this talk, I'm going to outline an experimental scenario, the stop signal task, which, we, which requires us to use the uh, convolutional GLM. Then I'm going to describe the particular problems with analyzing that task that requires to do so. And then I'll describe the convolutional GLM. This is the original paper where we describe the approach, if you want to read more about it. So what's the problem we're trying to address? Normally with the trial analysis in EEG, you take a set of EEG trials and you stack them up and average them and compare them across groups. Sometimes this is difficult because you're not really sure where to put the baseline, uh, because individual trials might have overlapping neural responses from overlapping stimuli and uh, there are systematic differences in response timings between conditions which is quite common in cognitive neuroscience and the convolutional GLM can try and address some of these approaches. So let's go for an example uh, question we might be asking in neuroscience. So here the question is what's the EEG correlate of stopping a planned movement? So for that, we need to have a particular task here, the stop signal task, parameterize our behavior. And from that, we need to extract the contrast, the contrast between conditions that we're interested in. So here we're going to isolate stopping. So I'm just about to start a movement, but I don't execute that pre-planned movement. What's the easy correlate of that? To find that, we need to be recording neural activity. Here we're going to use MEG data and apply the same behavioral contrast to the MEG data to get that correlate of stopping. So what does the task actually look like? Well, there's different trials, go trials and stop trials. On go trials, after a fixation cross and a random amount of time, there is a go signal that tells you it points in to the left or the right, tells you to press the left or right button. Most of the trials are like that. In a few trials, after a short delay, after the go signal, there's a red cross that tells you to withhold your response. And this delay here is variable. It's, uh, it's called SOA here, the stimulus on uh, asynchrony, but that's irrelevant. It's just a delay between these two stimuli. And if it's early enough and you haven't prepared your signal, you might be likely to abort it and have a correct response where you don't do anything. And if it's too late, then you might press uh, the button anyway, and that would be an error or an incorrect response. So that's the stop trial. And actually what we want to do is look at the difference between these two groups. The reason why we have the go trials is to you know, build up this prepotent uh, desire to press the button, but actually we're interested in these two groups. Now, if you look at the behavior of this trial, here are reaction times for those different um, parts of the trial across 150 trials in one participant. And if you look at the green and blue lines first, that you can see that over time, the responses, reaction time increases. So it's a non-stationary process. And what happened is in order to account for that, we need to set the algorithm that determines this variable SOA, this variable um, stop signal delay. So it tracks that time. So it doesn't become too easy for the person to stop. So this varies as well, and this is non-stationary. And the idea is that when you subtract the two, you get a relatively stable uh, purple line here, decision time. Now, what if we did the normal approach? So we'd compare those two conditions I was talking about, and they both have the stop signal, and they have um, go signals and uh, the fixation cross before them. In the error trials, you don't have time to stop, so you have the button press two. So here's the MEG data, and here's the stimuli across time on the x-axis. Normally, in the trial-based method, we'd cut the EEG data according, triggered on the stop signal, for example. We'd average across these trials and com compare uh, between these two trials. As you can see, there's a few issues with here. So we've got temporally overlapping responses. So, for example, a response to this go is overlapping much more with the stop signal than this go. And that's because of consistent errors 
or consistent differences, I should say, in between the reaction times for these two goes. It's no clear place in where you put the baseline. If you put the baseline for the stop signal here, um, it's much further from the fixation cross and from the go signal than here. And there's a variable or absent response in this case. You've got a response in this case and not in this case, a motor response. How do you account for that? Because we're not really interested in that. What we're interested on is the response to the stop signal. So this is problematic for the trial-based approach. And those are the three things I've talked about. So we can try a convolutional model. So the convolutional model, instead of cutting it up into trials, lays out all the time frequency data, for example, here, all across in a row. So time is going along the x-axis here and frequencies um, just along the y-axis here. And then you set the time of all the relevant stimuli. So um, a fixation cross, a go signal, this would be um, a button press, which is not visible here, but uh, it's one there, there's one there, and so on. And what, and what you then do is you then generate a set of dummy coded regressors. And these, again, go along in time. Each regressor, rep, regressor represents a different stimuli or action. Here, for example, every time there's a fixation cross, there's a box where there's a one which surrounds the fixation cross. And you do it so it's a very stimulus window. So it might be a couple of hundred milliseconds before and um, a second afterwards. And you can see, for example, um, where there is a button press here, um, we have a fixation cross before it coded, we have the stop signal and a button press. And where there isn't a button press, we have the fixation signal, stop signal, but no button press. So with this coding, you're able to code what's going on here across these different regressors. Um, we just have to be careful of the correlation between these regressors, which sometimes makes the model difficult to estimate. So this is the regression matrix we were talking about, the dummy coding. And this is a single frequency, uh, time frequency plot. Single, it's just one of the frequencies, just for demonstration. That's our Y, dummy regressors are our X, and then we generate the betas using, using the normal SPM approach. And if we did this at different frequencies, so these betas are for the different um, stimuli, but if we repeat them at different frequencies, we, for each stimuli we'd get a frequency by peristimulus time um, set of betas, which is uh, our uh, peristimulus response, peristimulus induced response. Now, when we, if we did that just with zeros and ones that, that coded the presence of these stimuli, we'd get a pretty flat response where we just get the presence or absence uh, of these um, of uh, power in this case at a particular time and frequency where these stimuli are. But in fact, we want to know how that modulates through the peristimulus time window. And so instead of a single one, what we do is we replace that with a set of basis functions. Here, um, these you can see these slowly vary and are essentially a set of um, uh, low frequency basis functions that shape the induced response. And so between these, we'll set weights on these and you can get an induced response per frequency. And when you combine all that together, you actually get a much more realistic peristimulus time response, which evolves in time over each frequency and is different for all the frequencies. So that's the full convolution. So for example, uh, we did this in the stop signal task. And if you just look at the um, some of the examples, here are some individuals. You can see that if we extract uh, data from M1, time frequency data from M1, and we look at the go signal, we get these depressions left and right, uh, M1, and less so in the SMA. And if we look at the button press, we get significant desynchronization, resynchronization uh, across the motor area and also the SMA. So we're getting realistic responses, which you might expect um, uh, if you were using a trial-based approach, which didn't have uh, confounded signals in it. So we get realistic responses where there's no convolutional confounds. 
What about when there's multiple overlapping compounds? Oh, sorry, I should say that once we've got these different um, induced responses, so here's the induced response from subject one for fixation cross, for the go signal, the stop signal, and subject two and three, as you go across, what you can do is take these to the second level and, for example, do a one sample t-test to get the overall um, average response. So in the same way, you can take this to the second level as you would in other SPM analyses. So we did that with the stop signal task. And here are some results that we found looking at M1, supplementary motor area, and the pre-supplementary motor area next to it on the metal wall, and the right and left inferior frontal gyrus, which are all areas that are thought to be involved in stop. So you can see that if we just look at the averages um, of the stop signal of in any condition, you can see there's a low frequency response across all these areas in the medial ball and the right and left IFG, which is quite early on and locked to the presence of the stop signal. And here, remember, we've removed the present, we've removed or adjusted for linear confounds related to other stimuli. If you look at the contrast we're interested in, so when there's a stop signal and you successfully stop, um, subtracted from when you, when you don't successfully stop, we can see that the EEG correlate of that is actually a slightly delayed uh, beta band response. And that's there um, in the pre-SMA, right IFG and left IFG in all these three different areas. And you can try and work out where it comes first, although it's difficult to do here because of temporal smoothing. And remember, this model, as I said, has accounted for differences, all these differences that were a problem before. So we found our EG correlate. So in summary, um, I've talked about when we can use the convolutional approach. So when the standard trigger-based epoching approach doesn't work, and this is especially the case if there's no particular baseline or it's hard to uh, get a baseline to correct against when we have induced responses which are quite long um, in the same case as an fMRI and the, the bulb response is quite long uh, and therefore overlapping and we need to disentangle them and when we compare conditions which have differences in reaction times or motor responses we tend to use a hierarchical convolutional model where we analyze it in at the subject level and then take it to the group level as in um, other times in SPM. And there's also the potential, for example, to include a parametric regressor, so uh, a regressor that varies through the whole time period and is not event locked. And these are two uh, papers that I've been quoting from through the talk. Thanks so much for your attention.